Hello, welcome to our webinar today on Lost in Time with Bryony Walmsley. She will be talking about the black hole between ESIA completion and project commencement. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice in the use of impact assessment for informed decision making. Today's presentation is part of a webinar series we initiated last year, and I invite you to visit our website with the link at the bottom of the screen to check out the recordings of a few of our recent webinars. Uh, you'll see we have some had some from health on the subject of health and indigenous people, social impact assessment, and all of those videos of our past webinars are available on demand on our website. We have two upcoming webinars scheduled. One is for March 13th, where we'll be speaking with someone from the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency on the proposed Canadian Impact Assessment Act. And a large chunk of that webinar will be her fielding questions from the audience. So it should be pretty engaging. On March 19th, we have a webinar on the subject of governance with a case study from El Salvador talking about reforming the environmental permit and review process. So I'll give you some more information at the end of our webinar about how you can get signed up for those. We have a bit of housekeeping just before we get started. We are in fact recording today's webinar, so it will be available on demand on our website and you will receive an email notification in a day or two that tells you that it's available and gives you the link to it. There will be time at the end for questions, so please at any time during the webinar today, enter your questions into the questions pane that you'll find in your webinar dashboard on the right side of your screen. The slides from today are also available and you can find those in the handouts pane of your control panel. Our presenter today is Bryony Walmsley. Bryony has two master's degrees in geography, one from the University of St. Andrews in the UK and one from the University of Alberta in Canada. She's amassed more than 38 years experience in environmental consulting, mostly in Southern Africa. Bryony has extensive experience in all aspects of EIA practice, including participating and managing large EIAs for infrastructure and mining projects throughout Southern Africa, guiding and reviewing EIAs, due diligence audits and compliance monitoring, and conducting training in all aspects of environmental management. She's authored and co-authored several books, reference documents, and publications. Bryony has managed the South African Office of the Southern African Institute for Environmental Assessment since 2004, and she's been a member of IAIA since the early 1990s. She served on IAIA's Training and Professional Development Committee and is currently a member of our awards committee. Her presentation today is based on the one that she gave at IAIA's annual conference last year in Montreal. And we're really pleased that she agreed to expand it to a webinar today because it was nominated as one of the outstanding presentations of the event. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to you, Bryony. Greetings, everybody. Um, it's, um, welcome to my webinar um, on this presentation on Lost in Time, the black hole between ESIA completion and project commencement. Today, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background and um, introduction to the study um, that really prompted this, um, this paper um, with a summary of the findings from that and then try to offer some solutions to some of the issues that we identified and um, then some conclusions. Um, the study was a case study analysis of seven road infrastructure projects um, throughout Southern Africa, funded by various development finance institutions, DFIs. The principal aims of the study were to determine the extent to which gender, social and health issues are integrated into the ESIA and ESMP processes for bank finance projects was also to determine how the bank monitors its loan conditions relating to those issues during project implementation and to develop, determine the effectiveness of social health and gender mitigation measures on the ground. Um, although the whole study was focused on looking at social health and gender issues, really um, we, we also looked and identified strengths and weaknesses throughout the entire environmental assessment process from initial screening to project completion in a more general um, form. 
The first thing that really struck me when I was doing the study was the issue around timelines and how long it takes to between ESIA completion and project construction commencement. Um, what we found when we analyzed these seven projects was that the average elapsed time from ESIA completion to the start of construction was over four years. Well, the elapsed time from the end of ESIA construction uh, completion to the end of construction was nearly eight years. That's the average. And if we look at project three on this uh, timeline, you'll see that actually nine and a half years elapsed between the start of ESIA and the start of construction. Um, and by the time construction finishes, it will be nearly 12 or more than 12 years to actual completion. In all of those projects, only two um, was the ESIA revised. And neither of those times was it on the request of the Environmental Authority. It was at the request of the Development Finance Institution, who requested some changes to be make sure that the project would be more aligned with their safeguard systems. And I can also point out that in, in 2015, there were two mission reports conducted by the various banks, but only one of those had any environmental or social um, people on those mission teams to investigate the projects. And the one where they did have, um, it was not a very critical appraisal of the project um, in terms of compliance with the loan conditions and the EMPR. And just to give you an example of some of the frustrations experienced, particularly on the ground, um, the Tanzanian Daily News um, reported a comment by the Minister of Works and Transport and Communication in the middle of 2016, who said that the government will not tolerate a construction firm slowing down the entire plan. The contractor has two months to finish the job. Mangaka residents and Tanzanians in general need to start using the road for their economic activities. And this project at that time was two years behind schedule. In project one, which is almost three years behind schedule, uh, inter an interview with a truck driver in November last year said, it being the Kazangula Bridge over the Zambezi River, which links Botswana and Zambia, should have taken place a long time ago. But I don't know what is wrong with the people that we entrust with our government. And finally, Project 7, which is also three years behind schedule, the um, a blog post said in 2016, the contractor suspends construction of the Nampula Road in Kuamba due to lack of payment, which seems to be one of the common problems associated with some of these bank funded projects. When the, the payments from the bank to the, to the country initiating the projects, um, there's problems in payments of the contractors for various reasons. So you can see that there's this huge delay um, in even just getting started and finished with construction. Now, we can put this in a bit of a diagrammatic form. Um, the, if you can see my, my mouse here. This top line represents the um, Development Finance Institution typical process, um, synchronized there with the a typical project design, construction and operation process and the bottom here is a typical EIA, ESMP and authority approval process. Now what happens between when ESIA and ESMP is completed and the time construction starts and we can unpack that a bit later but just within this process as well there are a few, few problems uh, when it comes to integrating health and social issues into the ESIA. First of all, it's screening, which is you know, which one of the root causes perhaps of some of these problems is that most projects are not screened on the basis of social sensitivity, vulnerability and risk. They're usually screened on the basis of the activity or um, perhaps uh, a sensitive environment, but not the social environment. And during scoping, there's inadequate identification of disadvantaged and vulnerable groups in most cases that we've analyzed. When it comes to the ESIA and the ESMP, because there's an inadequate description um, and impact assessment of the social and gender issues, 
then there's usually an inadequate environmental and social management plan as well. When we're talking health here, we're not talking about health in the workplace, we're talking about community health in the communities surrounding a project. When it comes to the tenders, quite frequently the ESMP is not included in the tender documentation. And when this happens, then you can expect that the construction um, companies will not have priced any of the environmental and social management issues that they need to take care of. And, and this is one of the root causes for failure um, in implementation of ESMPs on site. And what happens then once construction starts, um, particularly around health and social issues, who monitors this? Are the environmental authorities uh, equipped? Do they have health and social experts that can, um, can monitor the implementation of social and health measures? Or is this in the Department of Labor or the Ministry of Health or the developer? And there are huge question marks and gray areas around social and health monitoring and compliance auditing during implementation, during construction. And the same can be said during operations. If we look on the other side, on the bank um, process side, um, when the projects are categorized according to the bank safeguard systems um, and appraisal processes, again, a lot of projects are, based, are, are categorized on the basis of the activity and perhaps the environmental and biophysical sensitivities and not really on the basis of social sensitivity, vulnerability and risk. Um, the project appraisal reports in all the studies we looked are very uncritical of the ESIA and they tend to promote the benefits and, and underplay the negative impacts of the project. When it comes to the loan agreements, there's a process of what I call mitigation conflation. This is where the, all the issues that were identified in the ESIA get conflated a little bit into the e ESMP and even then, by the time it gets to the loan agreement, often comes down to a one-liner. Also, all the measures that have been identified are usually a one-liner that says ESMP implementation with some lump sum um, amount for that. What I also found in this case study was that when you looked at the costing in the ESMP for all the mitigation measures, um, the number was often very different when it came to the loan agreement with no um, rationale as to why those budgets might have changed, usually diminished. So the amount of money that should be set aside for ESMP implementation is, is, um, is something completely different to the what was first um, estimated. Uh, when it comes to appointing tenderers, um, there's a lack of critical evaluation of the human rights and social track record of a lot of tenderers and contractors. And that's also another problem. And then when it comes to compliance audits, um, because of the problem with this mitigation conflation, this one liner in the loan agreements, there is no accountability of looking expended at a social and environmental expenditure versus budget. Um, the social and health key performance indicators are, are not elaborated upon um, in the loan conditions. So there are no, there's no um, framework against which one can do compliance audits. Um, and then when it comes to the project compliance report um, and the monitoring of the results, um, again, there is very little critical appraisal of, of the project and how it has performed in terms of environmental and social issues. So you can see here that even after the ESIA, ESMP may have received a project approval or authorization, there's still a lot that can go wrong in the period after that, both leading up to and during construction and implementation, which I'm going to unpack a little bit now. Um, I call this really a transition phase, um, this time when nothing really seems to be going on, but actually a lot of things are going on. In that period of time, remember from the timeline, we're talking average lapse time on these seven projects of over four years. Baseline conditions change, especially social and health conditions due to natural demographic processes, influx of people, population growth, and so on. 
There's the impact of other development projects. This is a critical issue. Um, in the meantime, other projects may come in, into the same area, maybe being developed alongside um, these projects. For example, on one of my case study roads, the um, whole Nampula Corridor railway line was being built immediately adjacent to the future road development. Um, but the, there is no mechanism for where the cumulative effects could be really investigated. And then there's the natural degradation of the environment during that period of time as well, in many cases. But not only that, um, in all cases, you know, there's significant staff movements, there's a loss of institutional knowledge within the authorities and other government ministries, but also within the bank or DFI staff, and even the consultants that did the project. And bank and DFI operational safeguard systems change. We've, we've all witnessed um, some significant changes in many of the bank safeguard systems recently. Um, and these change. And so suddenly you've got a project that was predicated and built on old safeguard systems four, five, six, seven years ago. And in the meantime, those systems have changed. And so the project is now carrying on with, without the new safeguard systems in place. But national laws and policies can also change, as well as international targets for health and social development issues. And of course, perhaps the most important thing of all is that the project scope always changes, always. So, lost in time, this is the title of my talk. The, a lot of things get lost in this, this transition phase between ESI completion and project start. By the time construction starts, the ESIA and the ESMPs are totally out of date. The data is very old, and especially on social data. When the project ESIA was being done, they would have been looking at census data, particularly in Africa, that could already have been at least 10 years old. And if you're looking at these sorts of timelines, by the time the project is implemented, that data is maybe getting closer to 20 years old. So we're, we're working on, on extremely old data systems. And, and sets. But new issues come into play, like climate change um, and the increased vulnerability of, of people to climate change. Old laws and policies, um, and there's new social and health dynamics which may not have been predicted at the time. And these ESIAs and ESMPs are based on project scope that may well have changed. The resettlement action plan will also be out of date. Um, and thus estimates for compensation are totally inadequate. People come and go, um, and so the resettlement action plans are totally out of date, and yet the budgets for this don't change. Um, and so the loan agreements, particularly from these banks, are based on the original ESIA, ESMP, and resettlement action plan, but we are implementing projects which bear little resemblance to these original documents. And that's the sad, sad truth. But we could say, well, even in that case, surely there is quite a system of compliance monitoring going on. There's many safeguards in place that should make sure that these things, um, you know, that the projects will be implemented according to the ESMPs. Um, we've got the bank with all their safeguard systems. Usually many of the banks have those. Um, we have the client, it could be either the private sector or government sectors. Um, on all of these road projects, the, the government roads departments all had environmental and social management units, so they have a, a compliance monitoring task. On site, there is always a resident engineer or a um, client's representative. And in all cases, they are supposed to have an environmental and social monitor. We have the environmental authorities who are supposed, in all the laws of all the countries we were working in, have a mandate to conduct compliance monitoring and auditing of the projects to make sure that they are compliant with their records of decision and, and permits and authorizations. And then the contractor should also have environmental control officer and the social community officer to monitor um, compliance to the EMP on, on the ground. But unfortunately, what we found is that there are many, many failures in follow-up around these compliance monitoring systems. 
um, we found that the bank and the DFI staff basically left the monitoring up to the contractor. Because that's like putting the, the fox in charge of the hen house. Uh, if the contractor even does any monitoring, is it going to be independent is a big question. And we certainly found there were a totally insufficient number of bank inspections. As I said, there were only two mission reports and only one of those had an environmental and social person on board. And the inspections, even if they do happen, are definitely not critical enough. They're not based on any form of rigorous audit protocol based on the ESMP or KPIs of the loan agreement. Expenditures for social and health actions are not accounted for. There's no appraisal um, of effectiveness of the mitigation measures in preventing the negative impacts or, importantly, enhancing benefits. There's no critical review of the quarterly reports and is there any evaluation of the project in terms of the bank's own environmental and social safeguards? Usually not. It doesn't stop there with the bank. The resident engineers team um, is supposed on all our projects that we've reviewed is supposed to be a full-time environmental and social officer to oversee implementation by the contractor, but often none were appointed. And in fact, the resident engineer, engineers may not have seen the EMP or know the contents. Only one resident engineer of the seven projects we reviewed knew of the EMP and had a copy in the office. Um, environmental and social issues, again, out of the seven projects, only two of them um, were these issues part of routine weekly or monthly meetings and reports. But even then, there was no separate accounting for expenditure on any environmental and social issues, which I find remarkable when you can do bills of quantities for every last um, ounce of cement and nuts, bolts, screws and steel. But then the environmental and social issues are just usually one line item with one number and no, no accounting for that expenditure at all. And then little or no vigilance in monitoring social and health issues in affected communities by the, to make, by the resident engineers team making sure that the contractor does that. It carries on to the environmental authorities. Um, in all the case studies we reviewed, they were short staffed and under resourced. So very little monitoring was conducted. And they really rely on the fact that the EMP will be implemented correctly. And they, even if they do go and, and do compliance auditing, they rarely have a social and community health expert on the team. So those aspects just don't get monitored. And very rarely are penalties imposed for non-compliance. Well, then what about the implementing agency, the line ministries? Again, short-staffed and under-resourced. And although environmental and social experts um, may be present, they aren't full-time and they struggle to get around these projects once every quarter if they're lucky. And then whereabouts are all the other government authorities, departments and agencies that should perhaps be looking at community health issues um, and social issues. For example, ministries of health, national aids councils, local government and so on. And you know, who is making sure that social and health benefits are being enhanced? My answer is, is probably they aren't doing that at all. So we go back to this diagram and really what we see is that, well, the bank isn't, isn't perhaps monitoring as it should be. The client or the, the government representatives aren't really uh, equipped and resourced to, to monitor environmental and social issues, nor is the resident engineer, nor is the environmental authority. The environmental control officer, for various reasons, is often quite weak. There's usually no social and community liaison officer. And so we're left with the contractor, who largely gets up to doing his own thing without any recourse or to the environmental and social management plan. And well, I think the failures of contractors are fairly well known. Um, but on the seven studies, um, in fact, none of them in, our, in any of our seven studies had a copy of the EMP or knew the contents of it. Um, and even if the, they did have it, 
within these projects because of the significant time that had elapsed between ESIA completion and project start, there were significant changes in these projects, but there were no change management systems in place to deal with these changes. Um, there was no budget or knowledge of the budget for ENS mitigation, and certainly those budgets had not been, even if they were, <laughs> had not been um, accounted for for inflation during the, the elapsed period of time. Environmental and social issues are generally not part of the weekly, monthly meetings and reports, and therefore there is absolutely no accountability. And even if on the one project, um, sorry, two projects, there was an environmental control officer employed, they may not have adequate human financial and technical resources to perform all the necessary tasks. Did they have noise monitors? Did they have PM10 monitors to monitor dust? Um, answer was usually no. Um, and often they were very, very junior, so they really lacked any clout when they're dealing with senior um, contractors and REs. And because they live on site there, in many cases, because of their junior status, their integrity may be compromised. And we also found that a dedicated social community liaison and officers rarely employed. So we also found many failures in the, the implementation, particularly of the social part of the ESMP. Um, the loan conditions all usually required employment of local people, but these targets were often not met or enforced. Um, the EMP would perhaps say there should be 80% employment of, of local people, um, but some site inspections would, would reveal the fact that perhaps maybe one or two percent local people were employed and the rest were foreigners. Um, the employment of women, again, the loan conditions would try and set quite high targets for employment of women, but because of circumstances in rural Africa, these targets just were never ever met. Um, and no, no, no alternative means of trying to find employment for local women were made. There was a huge focus on HIV, AIDS and STI sensitization and awareness programs, quite rightly. But on, on the other hand, the, the, what the focus was on sensitization and awareness programs, whereas most people in sub-Saharan Africa are aware of HIV. And the focus perhaps needs to be more on prevention and behavior change um, and on health issues more broadly around comorbid conditions such as TB, hepatitis, as well as other um, health issues such as non-communicable diseases, pollution-induced diseases from dust and noise and so on, injuries and so on, which um, can all affect communities surrounding these projects. There was furthermore little or no monitoring of environmental aspects which have, might have health consequences such as dust fumes, gas, noise and so on. Little or no monitoring of community health. Little concomitant response from the Ministry of Health to improve healthcare facilities in these project areas. And really all of this boiled down to the fact that contractors generally believe that all of these issues are the responsibility of government and nothing to do with them. Now, the banks will all say, well, we have grievance mechanisms in place. But quite honestly, in all the situations we were working in, that it really, the, the way these grievance mechanisms are set up are inappropriate in rural Africa and often really way too late. Um, a lot of these issues should have, mitigation measures should have been um, design, designed in far earlier than they were. So what are some of the solutions to these issues? Um, first of all, from the bank side, um, there is quite a lot of work that still is being done currently by many of the big um, development finance institutions on developing guidance notes on health and gender and social issues in the context of large capital projects, particularly on health, to try and understand that health is more than just HIV, that health is a much broader concept um, relating to all aspects of health, including mental health, physical health, um, vector-borne diseases and, and non-communicable diseases and so on. But I think within the banks there's perhaps need for more training on some of the, 
on critical appraisals um, of the ESIAs, ESMPs, together with critical um, systematic compliance monitoring. There's certainly a case to be made that there should be an increased number of compliance audits during construction and operations, um, perhaps together with the environmental authorities. It could be, could be then a capacity building exercise for all involved. There need to be better health and social KPIs to address all the key health and social indicators. There's no reason for mitigation conflation, that the, the um, issues need to be all identified within the loan conditions so that you can have better accountability for budgets um, and can account for expenditure against those budgets for social and health issues. There needs to be more post-project monitoring to gauge the effectiveness of mitigation and realization of project benefits. Some things like health maybe have a long period of time, a latent latency period, when and you might not see the impacts um, immediately after construction finishes. They may only materialize one, two, five years later. So there needs to be more post-project monitoring. And then another key issue for me during the study was greater scrutiny of the contractors' human rights, environmental and social track records during procurement. One of the things that struck me was if the contractor wanted to do the right thing, um, there were two on, out of the seven um, on this, on this um, case study, um, if they wanted to do the right thing, then environmental and social issues got addressed. If they didn't, then they didn't. So it really, the, 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 the strength of the contractor's track record is a critical um, component, should be, in terms of procurement um, decisions being made. And then enforcing, from the bank side, enforcing local labor targets and gender targets. But the environmental authorities also, you know, they're, they're, if we start looking at the root cause, is to perhaps start by rejecting substandard ESIAs and ESMPs. Um, and although in all the countries we looked at for this case studies, the environmental law either states that the um, project must start with a, within a certain period of time, otherwise the proponent would have to reapply for a license, or it's written into the uh, record of decision or the, the authorization that says that this project must start within a certain period of time. It's usually around about three years, um, or if the project scope changes. But not one of the projects we, we reviewed was any ESIA updated or rev revised. Um, and that, that's a huge issue. Again, there needs to be more training on what I call critical appraisal and review and compliance monitoring um, when the authorities go to site. Um, and the compliance audits need to be conducted as per the legal requirements. Um, as I say, they generally are not being done nearly enough, with significant penalties being imposed for non-compliance. And finally, there needs to be greater cooperation with the ministries responsible for health, gender and social welfare and occupational health and safety to make sure that these health, the community health, gender and social issues don't fall in this big gap between um, the environmental ministry and these other ministries. The resident engineer um, really must be, again, this is where the bank must make ensure that they appoint an environment and safety officer, a uh, social officer, and make sure that the contractor implements all the requirements of the ESMP, and again, imposing penalties if necessary. And they must be far more rigorous in, in terms of including environmental social issues in meet, weekly or monthly meetings and reports, and very importantly, monitor expenditure on these issues on a monthly basis and general accountability. So in conclusion, a, what we found during this case study is that a good environmental and social impact assessment doesn't necessarily ensure a good project outcome. I mean, it helps, but it doesn't ensure a good project outcome if you've got weak um, compliance monitoring by all the various players. And so many issues anyway get lost or change in the transition period between the completion of the ESIA and the start of project construction. 
that, as I say, it could have a very good ESIA, but it may not bear, bear any resemblance to the project that's finally been implemented on the ground. And in fact, some poor and good ESIAs and ESMBs can result in a good outcome, believe it or not, if a responsible contractor is appointed. If there is strong environmental control officers and safety community liaison officers appointed, if they have the budgets and resources available to do their jobs properly. Things like forming community liaison committees can be extremely valuable in terms of project change and dealing with community issues um, and so on. Forming partnerships, that's a very key thing with NGOs and, and community based organizations to monitor health and social issues on site, rather than having the, the contractor do it themselves. The forming partnerships can be extremely valuable in making sure that um, those monitoring um, of health and social issues happens. Regular reporting of environmental and social issues at meetings and monthly reports um, and with a diligent and vigilant resident engineer and again with the authorities carrying out regular compliance audits and the banks doing their job as well so that we actually the safeguarding systems are actually put in place and implemented and then one could be sure of a better outcome. Finally, we can just say that there is, this is from Amnesty International, there is no excuse for any company, lender or investor to claim to be unaware that their investments could impact human rights. And having said that, we, what we're trying to make sure is that developments in Africa don't end up leaving the local communities in much poorer state in terms of their well-being and their health than they would have been if the ES EMPs have been properly implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryony, for a great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in and some that were posed uh, during the registration process. So let's get to those. Uh, Ross asks, Bryony, if you were able to track the financial flows down through your model, and where money was allocated towards ESIA issues, but then disappeared either through poor accounting, management, reallocation, et cetera, down through the financial chain, the financial black hole, so to speak. All bankers and economists would say they allocated enough for risk to be managed from the beginning. How do you believe that we can make the ESIA actions better linked to accountability during transition to the next party? That's a that's a very good question, Ross. Um, quite, I did try to track the expenditures, um, and I couldn't do it. The not all ESMPs actually had were costed. That was one problem. But even when they were, the it was very very difficult to reconcile the amounts that were set aside in the ESMP and the resettlement action plans to the amounts that were set aside in the loan conditions and the loan agreements. I couldn't reconcile them at all. In some cases, um, they would go up, but in most cases, the amount um, would go down without any justification. Even sometimes when the project scope expanded to include um, more um, households that needed to be resettled, but the budget for resettlement would, would actually go down. So that, with no explanation whatsoever. So really, really poor. You could not track the expenditure at all. Um, how do you resolve that? Well, I think I think by having um, a more detailed listing of the of the um, environmental and social measures that need to be implemented with the budget attached to those things individually so that you can actually track the expenditure for certain aspects of those things in a more detailed manner. And also the resident engineer, they track all the costs for all the, the hard engineering factors, but they don't track the costs for, well, you know, for each item of environmental and social management. And they could do a lot more in that, in terms of that. It, it should be possible, but it isn't, it isn't being done. Fiona has a couple questions, so we'll take them one at a time. First, in your experience, Bryony, are similar findings observed in other industries subject to loans from DFIs? such as the oil and gas or the mining industries? 
Sorry, just uh, say the say repeat that. Sure. Uh, in your experience, are similar findings observed in other industries that are subject to loans from DFIs, for instance, oil and gas or mining? Um, I'm not so familiar with the oil and gas, um, and I haven't done a, a sort of detailed uh, sort of forensic review of any any of them in the mining industry. The mining industry um, would be similar. That again, there's very little the, the traceability, um, uh, yeah, of issues through the process. And again, mining industry also suffers from long, long delays um, between project EIA and when when the thing starts. Um, I've experienced those very much directly. And yeah, I would imagine in mining, those the similar findings could be applied. I'm not so familiar with the oil and gas industry to be able to comment on that. Okay. And Fiona's second question is, considering the role DFIs play in helping to ensure safeguards are in place, what did the relevant DFIs do in these case studies when your observations were communicated to them, or was it already too late? In most, most cases, it was two, two of the projects were still about to start. Um, and couple were just in the process of finishing the others they had finished um the and unfortunately i've not had any feedback the the findings went all went into um development of a project brief or a policy brief sorry a policy brief for the main bank that was involved um to alert them to these facts the the report was supposed to be made available sadly i haven't um, i haven't heard how much of this has been adopted and taken up to make positive changes. Um, you know, and I think this is all the sort of downstream end. Each of these banks have got very good safeguard policies in place. It's really, it's, I think it's failing in the actual implementation on the ground of these policies. All right. Um, Inigio has a question followed by an example. So his question is, do you think ESIA should have a legal validity? For example, in Spain, after two years, you have to apply for a new two-year validity period. And after those four years, a new EIA has to be passed. So back to his question, do you think ESIA should have a legal validity? Yes, I do. I think that's exactly will address a lot of the, the root causes of a lot of these problems to, to make sure that they're current. Um, and that they are more based on on actual conditions on the ground. I think that would have done a huge would do a huge amount for making sure that they're they're more relevant to what we're looking at for sure. John is asking, uh, cumulative impacts are often more significant than the impacts of an individual project. So mitigations suggested in an ESIA often require commitment from institutions outside the IAP circle. How do you get them to commit? <laughs> That's a difficult one, John. Um, and it was very obvious in this situation where it, uh, the one situation was the uh, the Nampula infrastructure corridor. And the EIA for the road was done a long, long time ago. Um, and I think in the meantime, they started constructing the rail, the railway right immediately adjacent to the road. So the massive cumulative impacts, but because the EIA was not then required to be updated, um, the, the cumulative impacts were never really captured. Um, so yeah, that's a difficult one. And I think if it's the same or similar um, DFI that's being involved, they should they, they really should be demanding in that case some sort of cumulative assessment. If they're funding two projects within the same area, that there should be a cumulative effects assessment that's carried out as well. Shirley asks, uh, she's talking about the statutory EIA system in Hong Kong, and she says there's no specific requirements for SIA, hence such impacts are not addressed for significant social impacts, and conflicts erupt at the public consultation stage leading to legal challenges. Mm. Any proposed solutions? I think change your legislation. <laughs> um, I think that what 
I've been working with the United Nations Development Program. Um, well, I worked on it for, for about six years um, in Africa, looking specifically at the inclusion. We started off with health, but more generally social issues as well. And what we found was that in quite a few countries, the definition of the term environment um, really only referred to the biophysical environment and actually didn't refer to the social or health or any other cultural environments that you might imagine. And that, that was seen as a, as a major um, shortcoming and somewhat out of date. And a lot of countries are, are beginning to change their, when, when they do change their laws, are now having a much more uh, broadly defined um, definition, sorry, a broad definition of the term environment, which, which does include social and health and cultural issues in that definition. And so that gets around and that gets over the problem. Um, so really, um, unless the law changes or, or regulations change, that um, is really the only way that you can bring social and health in, um, issues into the forefront of the EIA. Nick uh, says that beyond the grievance mechanisms of DFIs, he's asking if you think there is scope to set up an independent advisory platform or organization which would be able to provide the kind of ESIA follow-up or investigations needed to assist in making implementation more accountable or transparent. Wow, yeah. Um, that's an interesting suggestion. How that would work in practice is, is not as difficult. Um, given the, the sort of size and scope and global spread of, of development projects, um, yeah, to have some independent body reviewing them would be difficult. Now, the problem really lies for me, I think, is with very rural, remote communities and you know, the recourse they have to, to any, of these, these, um, any, any of these bodies, whether it's the banks or, or the environmental authorities, primarily because the people don't know what their rights are, they haven't got access to the internet, um, and they don't know that they are being badly impacted, or they probably know they're being badly impacted, but have no idea of how, how they can act against it. So the grievance mechanisms for the, you know, the banks have got in place are fine for people who've got access to the internet and who know how to, to exercise their rights. But I do think it's, it's very problematic for people in rural areas. And unless, you know, as, as this um, person suggests, you've got some sort of international watchdog, but you know, can they really look at every single project on the ground? I, you know, I'm not sure how that would work in practice. But it's something worth thinking about. Uh, Dorcas uh, asks if organizations should budget for all health issues in the project area, do you think that would make the project not feasible, particularly in rural Africa? Um, Dorcas, that's, um, that's actually something that's being looked at very closely in Zambia, because I know Dorcas is in Zambia, um, where particularly for road projects and other projects where they are currently looking at levying a, a percentage of the capital budget of the project for to finance health development in that project area. Um, that's something that's being looked at um, right now. Um, and other countries, again, this has sort of been prompted by the United Nations Development Project that I referred to earlier, that um, at looking at sort of financing for health in project areas. So it wouldn't be the developer per se, um, well, not directly, it would be through levying an amount, a percentage of the capital cost that will then be sort of ring fenced for health development in that region. Um, so that, yeah, that is, a, that is an option that's being looked at. Antonella asks, unless legal requirements for the validity of the ESIA are in place, would the contractual agreement have a sort of leverage or enforcement power in this view? But yeah, I mean, the contract, if, if, the, if the ESMP is included in the contract, then it is the well, it's the, the developer and or his site representative, the resident engineer, is their responsibility to make sure that the every condition of the contract is being met. 
that, that's why it's a contract. It's a legal legal document. So the, the, there is that mechanism. Unfortunately, it's not being exercised. I think that's the case. Um, you know, not on all projects. I've been working on a project recently where it most definitely is being enforced, um, but it's it's not not in in Southern Africa. But um, yeah, that's that's the role of the resident engineer is specifically to make sure that the terms of the contract are being addressed. And the loan agreement um, is also a legal legal document between the recipient country and the, the bank, um, and that is a legal document that should also be enforced. But because nobody's there's no accountability for environmental and social issues, it's just not being uh, being enforced. Vanillin is asking, can the ESIA be aligned with local regulations to give ESIA a legal basis in the country where it's operating? This would also impose penalties on violators based on legal framework, not only based on a document. Not sure if I fully understand the question. All countries, um, well, certainly in Africa, all countries, except for I think two, have an environmental and impact assessment reg, um, law and regulations for the country. And so all projects are required, first and foremost, to comply with national laws. Um, and this is, again, why um, you know, it, is, it is a law, <laughs> legal commitment, and in the project authorizations, they are supposed to comply with the commitments made in the ESMPs. But as I mentioned, sadly, the, the environmental authorities generally aren't able to monitor implementation properly and let alone in, you know, enforce conditions of those licenses. So again, there is a legal framework there, but it's it's just not being exercised. I, think, but, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> uh, Patricia asks if the DFI safeguard policies and project appraisal systems had any effect on project outcomes. Um, I'm just thinking hard before I answer, make a very quick answer to that. Um, no, they had no, they really, I don't think had any impact at all. And, and nor did the, and sadly on all of these projects, nor did the EIA. The, the most, the defining factor of the project success or not was a good contractor and a good resident engineer. Sadly. <laughs> Uh, Sean is asking, to what extent were gender, health, and social issues integrated into the ESIAs and ESMPs that you studied? Oh, yeah, that, that uh, we wrote quite a long report on that. Um, generally, very poorly um, is the short answer um, at every level, both the identification of issues, the analysis of issues, there were no separate, there were no separate um, health studies conducted. Um, social impact assessments, there was only, I think, one, Cousin Gula Bridge, where there was one sort of standalone or separate SIA consultant who did a study. Um, so generally, no, they weren't, they weren't very well considered at all. And, and even if when they were, uh, particularly on the health and gender side, very, very minimally. And we have time for one last question before we wrap up. Maria is wondering if social health and gender mitigation measures identified in the ESMPs were effective in preventing or minimizing impacts on the local communities. Only insofar as as they were implemented. Um, the, as I said, the two contractors who were reasonably okay um, went yeah they they did a lot and they in both situations they had um appointed a community liaison officer and they had um people doing um service providers doing hiv sti um sensitization so they had quite a close um contact with the community particularly through these regular community meetings monthly community meetings where issues could be raised and addressed kind of at the same time that was very effective so again, it boils down to having you know, somebody on the ground contractor who is committed to doing the right thing. Um, and so you know, they, they were, in those situations, I would say that the ESMP was being implemented and did make a difference to the people on the ground. Um, 
but yeah, it was not, it was only really because of the commitment of the contractor. All right. Well, thank you, Bryony, for a great presentation and a very dynamic and engaging Q&A session afterwards. And thank you to all you participants who uh, who signed into the webinar at whatever time of the day it is where you are located. Uh, we appreciate your participation. In a day or two, you will receive a link to the recording. And you will also be able to, at that time, um, at that same place, there will be an opportunity to sign up for our next webinar on March 13th on the Canadian Impact Assessment Act. The registration for the El Salvador case study on environmental permit and review will be opening shortly um, and it will be at the same location, but we'll be sending out news information about that as well. While you're at our website, please feel free to check out, uh, we have a variety of resources and publications available, quick tips, best practice principles, uh, training videos. So lots of information to check out while you are there. There will be a brief survey when you leave the webinar. We encourage you to respond to those quick questions. Uh, feedback is always great so that we can improve future webinars and make things better. And if you have suggestions for burning topics you'd like to see other webinars on, there's an opportunity for you to mention that there as well. We know your time is valuable and we hope this, val this webinar was valuable to you as well. We'll see you next time.